I'm so thankful for the opportunity tonight to share. Um, it's always a privilege, and again, just to be able to share and proclaim. And tonight, I'm I'm going to share quite a bit of scripture in the Book of Acts. It's about Paul, but in that, I just also want to tie it into how we see so many things right now coming at us as far as people, as far as circumstances, and we can all quickly recognize in the last five years how things are beginning to escalate. I'm sharing this because I'm fully convinced we are going to have to be prepared to push through obstacles that are consistently growing in number and amount because knowing God is going to finish what God set forth to do, and He uses the church to do that. So with that being said, we're going to look at Paul in the last uh, chapters of Acts. And as we do that, you can turn to Acts 23. We're going to read one verse there, 23.11. Then we're going to flip over to Acts 25, and that's kind of where we'll launch out and, and go forward. But as we think about these things, I also want to tie them to some personal experiences because of the things that God's revealed and the things that I've personally seen Him do when we're just pushing through these tasks. Some of you will have heard some of these stories and some of these things that God has accomplished as, as we've cried out to Him to be able to go through them. As we launch out, I just want to go before the Lord. Father, we just again thank You, God, just for this time that we have that we can gather this wonderful place, God, just that we can come and be comfortable just as we learn of you. Father, I'm so grateful for that. Father, again, just the opportunity to share. And God, may we just each be changed as your word, God, as it changes us, as you speak to us. May we each be changed because of it. May we each be encouraged because of it and better equipped. Father, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Mike, I truly appreciate the opportunity tonight. Um, so as we go to chapter 23, let's look at verse 11. And I'm going to read this because this is also how we're going to finish. It says, But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so must you also bear witness at Rome. And we can recognize that he had been before the high priest, and in this had been arrested and because of his trouble. <clears throat> and, and we're going to talk about his last journey, his last missionary journey as he journeyed to Rome. And to think about what all that means, um, as we look at this verse, the goal was clearly laid before Paul. You will go to Rome. God told him this. So Paul knew he would end up in Rome. I, I say that and I think back two or three years ago in the life of Rahil as things began to change. And if you'll remember, we, we began to gather sewing machines in this body early in the year to be able to take for ministry purposes. And as we gathered those, we were set to go in late March in 2020. And everybody will remember what began to happen during that time. That's when things began to change rapidly as far as gas stations not being open, as far as restaurants being shut down. But God had placed in the heart of this body to gather these sewing machines for the purpose of ministry. So it was decided to push forward. The sewing machines got delivered. The, the people there on the ground utilized them for further ministry. Some of them went into homes. And this is what's incredible. We had no idea when we began to gather those that they would be utilized to make masks. We didn't know that. God knew that. And as God called us to do and to go, as we fulfilled in obedience what He asked us to do, He carried out His plan. And I want us to recognize it's all about God's plan. And we have to stay the course. That's the reason we're going to talk about this tonight. It's going to get harder and harder and harder to stay the course. But it's going to also, if we will just by faith, trust Him when He calls us to do something, when He places an opportunity for us to go, that we're obedient in that as we go. So with that being said, let's flip over to Acts 25. <clears throat> we're not going to cover the whole chapter. 
But I just want to pull some things out that we can look at. So as we talk about this, there's, there's kind of two points, trial and tribulation and the opposition by others. And we need to recognize Paul encountered many oppositions as he was going. In saying that, I want to say this to all of us. Ministry and missions is as we go. It's not so much of where we go, it's as we go. Because it's God that directs our paths to get to those places. And He utilizes that because it causes us to encounter other people as we do. So Acts 25, verse 12. And here we see, Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you'll go. Saying these words to Paul, it's very clear, and it goes back, and it confirms what was said earlier in Acts 23.11. And God is carrying that out through people. In Acts 26, verses 24 through 26. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after examination has taken place, I may have something to write. I have no doubt it seemed silly to him that he was fixing to send a man for sentencing when he really had no charges against him. And, and coming from him to the king, how that might appear. Why would you send this man to me? So again, he wanted to put him before Agrippa. Here in verses 27, For it seems to me unreasonable to send a, preach, a prisoner and not specify the charges against him. Now I want us to jump into Acts 26 verses 24 through 26. Acts 26. 24 through 26. We're going to launch out in 24. Now, and again, Paul is before Agrippa, and, and he's telling Agrippa, and there's been a whole lot of things take place here in between this. He's given his testimony yet again in, in, the, latter part, in the middle part of this chapter. And here in verse 24, he says this, Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. This is what I, wanna, I want us to kind of key in on. When we begin to actively share our faith in the world we live in, because of other people's own experiences, own opportunities to learn the truth, their own upbringing, their own traditions. There are many, many people that are going to feel or voice this in opposition to us. In other words, the way I think we might commonly say it, Paul, are you silly? Um, it's, in our, it's in our peer groups. It's in our workplaces. It's in the marketplaces. As we actively share, there will be times that we encounter this. And, and here would be my question. Do we fail when we actively share? And the answer is no. Because a person has to determine whether they believe the truth or not. And we see here that, that Festus is saying these words. He doesn't believe the truth that's being told to him. It's an active choice of his own will to choose that or not. And we need not be discouraged when we're hearing these things. One of you, most of you or many of you have probably heard this part of my life. The first time that in a, in a work setting that the truth was shared with me. It was from an inspector, and it was lunchtime, and I was sitting on my tailgate. What's, what's odd about all this? I remember where I was. I was north of Clarksville on a Forest Service road. We were laying a pipeline there. I was eating my lunch, and, and Dallas came up to me, and he, and he had his Bible, and he opened his Bible, and he read me Romans 3.23, for all is sin and fall short of the glory of God. And he flipped over, and he read Romans 6.23, or began to, he said, and the wages of sin is death. And I put my hand out and I said, Dallas, stop. 
I said, this is my lunch hour. You're not paying me to listen to that junk. If you want to tell me about it later, you come find me and you can tell me. I'll listen to you when I'm back on your time. Which I half-heartedly meant that because even though I might have heard it, I wasn't interested in listening to it. But I want to again proclaim the power of God's Word. Because the night I was saved when I was 30, this is in my early 20s, when I was 37, the night that I got back up out of my bed and, and confessed my sins and let the Lord know that I wanted to follow and serve Him, those verses were brought back up in me. So even though Dallas thought he failed, he did not fail. Point being, when God's Word is proclaimed, it cannot fail. And we see here Paul doing that. So we need to be actively doing that in spite of the opposition from people, the trials and the oppositions that come from that. So as we've read there in, in um, verse 24, I want us to see 25, but he said, Paul in his own defense, I am not mad, most noble Festus. Here's a thought I had. If somebody calls us out, how do we sometimes want to act? If somebody tells you you're nuts or you're crazy, do you want to then return? And, and acknowledge their position, most noble Festus, and respect back to them. We're called to do that. And Paul sets this example forth here in this text. But he says, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak, speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. Again, we can recognize this was all out in the open, and truth is out in the open. And he speaks of in a corner. That's where darkness tries to hide. And the light invades that darkness as we're actively proclaiming. And we encounter darkness every day of our lives because, again, the prince of this world is very active in this place. So, not in this place, in the world we live in. So now I want us to jump, and we're going to look here in verses. Um, 26 or 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, and recognizing he not only had audience in front of Agrippa, I would to God that not only you, but also all those who hear me today might become almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. In other words, Paul had no animosity towards any of them. He did not want any of them to be a prisoner of any sort. But he, he much wanted them to become like he was, and that was to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he appealed to them all. And again, we don't see the outcome of this. I had opportunity as a new believer in 2004, I got to go on my first mission journey to Juarez, Mexico. And we were working with an interpreter. There would be teams of two of us and an interpreter that would go with us. And we'd just walk in the street, knocking on doors. And there were, I had this amazing experience of, of God and how He works. We're sharing with this probably 16 and 18-year-old young lady and young man. And we're talking to them, and, and we go through the Gospel. And we ask this question, is this something you would like for your life? Would you like to know Jesus? And this man behind us said, I would. We had no clue the man was there. But he was standing there. God placed him in that moment, in that time, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and dealt with him in such a way that he understood it. We didn't have a clue he was there. We're just actively doing, as we go, what God's called us to do. <clears throat> so. As we recognize, Paul would have them to be that. So let's read in verse 22 or 32. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. We see it yet again. God's plan for Paul's life and where he would go. So Acts 27. Verse 11. Or verse, uh, forgive me. Verse 9. Acts 27, verse 9. I flipped the page too quick. 
Now when much time has been spent, the sailing was now dangerous because the east wind was, all our, was already over. Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. They chose not to listen. Paul, verse 11 says, Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship by th than by the things spoken by Paul. So we recognize that Paul is fixing to be on a ship out on the ocean. And what I know of Paul's history, I, I don't necessarily know that Paul was a sailor, but he did understand that the wind blew certain times of the year. And because of that, he asked them and, and explained to them. But here we see, as the world goes, most in, most in this world listen to man's intellect. They listen to man's ways. And as Paul challenged these, recognizing they said no, so out of his own control, he's put on this boat to make this journey. So as we move on, I want us to look at the that's by others, that opposition by others, and the circumstances brought on by others. So now we're going to look at the trials and tribulations that come by other circumstances. And again, these will happen. Acts 27, we're not, we're not going to read these, okay, just in the essence of time. But 13 through 20, they speak of a, of a wind coming up. They talk of having to undergird a ship. And again, in, wooden, in the times of wooden ships, to put cables and things around it where the ship didn't absolutely fly apart from the pressure of the washing waves and things like that. And they had to tie down the cargo. They threw some of the ship's gear into the ocean and then they didn't see the sun. In other words, it was cloudy and stormy for several days and several nights as they traveled. So here in Acts 27, verses 21. 27, verse 21. But after a long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, he reminded them of what he had said, Men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Now I urge you, take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. God had told him he would go to Rome. Now he's reminding him, do not be afraid. And because of this, Paul has pushed through and continues with the task at hand and getting to minister to those that are around him because he lets them know that God himself had spoke to him and that none of them would perish. So he began to be able to minister to these to show, him who, show them who God was. So as we look at that, Verse 25, Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told to me. And I'm back to my original launching point. When God sets something before us, His timing is perfect. And we need to recognize that in spite of the opposition, we need to continue to push forward. I've heard people say, well, I thought I was supposed to do this, and then this, 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 and this began to happen. And I would say sometimes maybe that is. But if, if we clearly hear from God and what God desires for us to do, and we set out on that path, He doesn't say there won't be opposition. He doesn't say there won't be trials and tribulations. He says He will be with us through all of those things. And sometimes it's in those very things that He has an opportunity to display Himself. And we can recognize in this text we just read, God put Himself on display not only to Paul, but to all those that were on that ship with Him. Just recognizing to continue with the task. So there in verse 25 we see God confirmed what He said as he set him on this journey all the way back in Acts 23. So Acts 27, um, 
these next few verses, 26 through 32, they began to listen to Paul and to do what Paul was asking them to do and to push forward with his, his, what he was telling them in order to keep them safe. But here in verse 33, And the day was about to dawn, and Paul implored them all to take food. Today is the fourteenth day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. In other words, they're doing everything they can do just to keep the ship afloat. They're working, they're not taking time to eat. Paul is encouraging them here. God has got this. Take rest. And I'll say this, sometimes when we're on these pathways and doing these things, we need to remember that our bodies have to rest. Our minds have to rest. We need to spiritually rest in Christ. If we're not careful, we get so focused on the tasks and the things set before us that we forget our relationship with Him. And I'm saying that about myself probably more than anybody in this room because I am that person that gets task-focused instead of relation-focused. And we're called as followers of Christ to be relationally focused. Um, So as we say that, knowing that in this, it's okay to rest. Paul here himself says that, you know, as the day was about, implored them all, take food. Today is the 14th day. Verse 34, Therefore I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall off your head, will fall from the head of any of you. So God, he's telling them yet again, God's got this. He's going to take care of you. Be, Be of good courage. 35, and when he had said these things, he took bread, gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. Yet again, acknowledging God in everything they had and all the provision that had been given to them. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food for themselves. And then we know how many he got to witness to. 276 persons on this ship. Now, instead of he could have been hunkering in fear, he could have been more concerned about his own health, he could have been hoarding food, he could have been doing many, many things, but instead he chose to minister to these people. So, um, out of time, we're going to skip through verses 41. Uh, I do want to say this, the, the ship was completely destroyed as it ran up on the ground and the waves continued to bash it from the back. They began to let lifeboats down. Paul told them, don't do that. If anybody leaves now, their lives will be lost. And they ended up. And in this, even God gave more grace to Paul because as they were getting off the ship, or going to get off the ship, those, the, those with the centurion wanted to kill them, kill the prisoners lest any of them could escape. But the, the centurion told them, do not, because he wanted to preserve Paul, because of, again, Paul had began to minister, and they recognized the value of a godly person in their midst. Therefore, that did not take place. Um, you know, I think this was maybe shared Wednesday night, but with, with our friend Bakri, as he went into, I don't want to say a lot about countries or anything like that, just because of recording, but as he went in that Part of these water filters, or his water filters were confiscated by customs. For I guess that's what it's called, by customs. But here's the amazing thing. They let him buy them back. Well, I realize that's a hiccup in what needed to be done. And I don't have an amount that he had to buy them back for. When he is, he had the ability to buy them back, so the water filters still made the journey. And here's what I would challenge the thought with. I wonder who all got, he had opportunity to speak to because of that, because it delayed his time, and therefore he got to visit with folks that he wouldn't have without that. And he clearly voiced what they were for. And again, that causes people to wonder, well, why would you do this? Whenever you're sharing that, you can point to why you do it as you go. And it's incredible that he would have got to do that. We personally had an encounter, um, some of you know this, some of you don't, this summer when we went to uh, Cincinnati. I've never seen a tire um, on one of the vans. It had a chunk tore out of it. Um, 
And I, I really don't know how that happened. Uh, it had two places that a chunk was tore out of the tread of it. I've never seen a tire like that. So anyway, we, we've got things we're supposed to be doing, places we're supposed to be, and here's this chunk. So it involved quite a bit to get it fixed. We had to take the trailer off this van, get it hooked to the other van. We had to find a place to go get it fixed. And here's what I want to say, Saturday, when we discovered it. The thing is, tire shop's open. We were able to find it. And logistically, it took some doing, but we were able to get there. But here's the incredible thing that came out of that. Whenever I was taken back to get it after we had done our block party, and I went in, anyway, they're, they're dealing with the ticket and trying to get it, up, uh, get it going. And anyway, we just got to talking. This young man sitting there. And I just began the conversation. Young man, do you have any spiritual beliefs? Anyway, no, not really. We had this conversation, and at the end of it, this is what he told me. He had never heard about Jesus. 26 years old, never heard about Jesus. Working in a tire shop in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so anyway, there was a Bible on the, one of the little Bibles out in the van. Been there for years, so I thought, you know what? <laughs> I went and got it. God left it there, handed it to him. He was so grateful. He followed me back out in the parking lot and talked to me a little bit. Anyway, we had some more correspondence back and forth for a while. This young man's got some things going on in his life. I'm not going to speak much about those. But anyway, I've tried to text and call. Well, it's been about a month since I'd heard from him. Well, when we were out at Chaffee Saturday, the Saturday before last, he calls me. So I go talk to him. Well, this young man, because of some life choices at 13, is dealing with some circumstances none of us have ever had to. But the point being, he had been detained. He got out. He took, it was 10 minutes after he got out that he called me. And we began to talk. Here's what's incredible. He said when they caught up to him, and they, he knew they were going to take him in, they had already gotten him in the car, and he asked the officer, can I take that Bible? And the officer said, sure. So he went and got it and handed it to him. Guess what the young man did while he was in? Plenty of time. He began to read the Bible. And it was a different conversation with him that Saturday. And I've touched base with him again today. And he and I are to speak tomorrow. I'm going to ask you all, please pray that he has full understanding of what Jesus Christ has done for him. And pray that he's not hardened, but that he will accept that out of circumstances. Now, could have been totally frustrated. I'm telling you, all of our circumstances involve people. And if we will utilize those as we go for our Lord and King, He will, he will reveal Himself and He will use those circumstances. So as, as we work through that, I want us now to look at uh, Acts 28, verse 16. And here it is. Now, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Here he is in Rome. And we didn't even talk about the viper in Malta that crawled out of the woodpile and bit him on the hand. First of all, that hurt. Now, it says he didn't swell or get sick. But if a snake bites you, it hurts. I know that because it's stuff sticking in you. Anything goes through your skin, it hurts. Point is, even his display to the people of Malta. And it, there was really no dialogue. That, that's what's kind of amazing to me. There was really no dialogue between Paul and these people. And the only conclusion, and again, this is opinion, okay? I'm not trying to add to or take away. The conclusion I've come to is these people spoke a language that nobody knew. But we do see where Paul healed. He healed some of those people there on that island as they were sick and many came to him. And then as they left, God for, com, continued in his provision for them. It says, and they gave them what they must need as they launched from Malta headed to Rome. But again, we see, and then they came to Rome. Here's some of the takeaways from what we've talked about tonight. We are to continue to minister and share even when the circumstances aren't ideal. Sometimes it's even out of those 
unideal circumstances that we have the most opportunity. We have to guard against putting our focus on the circumstances. And the other takeaway, we all know this, God will complete what He says He will do. He will finish it. I hope that we can always be a part of helping Him finish that as we serve Him, the privilege of that. And I said helping. God doesn't need our help. He allows us to participate because He's going to do it with or without us. And I also want to say this body is incredible in what God is presenting and how it embraces the opportunities we've been given. So just consider these questions as we go away from this time. Are you immobilized by your circumstances? Think about that statement, that question. Are you immobilized by your circumstances? The next one would be, are you focused on your own comfort? Are you focused on your own comfort? And last of all, are you proclaiming and ministering to others in the name of our Lord? All I have. Father, we thank you, God. Thank you so much. Just knowing you're going to do what you said you'll do. Father, for our own salvation. And God, the cost that's paid for that. May we consistently remember how ugly sin is. God, may we consistently be active in proclaiming you as we love you first and then love us. Father, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.